Welcome to a new episode of the Surprise Multiplayer Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Ozzy Monroe. Today, along with my co-hosts, Jeremy and John, we dive into a slightly different topic for us. We venture down a road of politics, law, and the societal implications of our evolving communication landscape. We kick things off with a discussion about the impeachment process and how it works. We're also putting on our big boy pants and opening a channel for our listeners to provide any feedback, suggestions, or ask any questions. We can now be reached at Banter Review Crew at SurpriseMultiplayer.com. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. The interesting thing about this for me is that I, I thought that when they did the January 6th, like the thing, I, I remember there being some kind of vote about impeaching him. I guess that's what I'm thinking of. Like he, the, the Congress voted to impeach and that did not. So the impeachment process is two factor. Impeachment means that they have agreed that there are basically enough rules for a court hearing to happen in the Senate. So you can impeach somebody and then the Senate will preside over whoever right. was impe- impeached. That's all that they've ever done. And he has never been found. You can. He was never found guilty. He was never found guilty. They, yeah, they, no. Well, it, technically not guilty, but it, he would be removed from office. There's two votes, right? But impeachment, there's the. Just the Senate. No, there's. Well, uh, no, there's the vote to impeach and then the House. vote to convict. Yeah, and there's the. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the House can do a standing. So I learned this recently. The, the House can just say, we agree to impeachment by a majority vote. There is no rules of what they have to do. They do have committees and they have their own process, but it's whatever the fuck they want. Right. All they have to do is say, we agree by a simple majority of an impeachment. And that means that person now has to go. The Senate has its own rules for what they do for to fund. To well, but it, it's, but it's not no, simple. It's like, not a have, court of law. But, well, but, correct. But they also, but they, it, there's also a little bit more to it. Like they have to deliver articles of impeachment, right? Like yes. you actually have yeah. to explain what you're, I, uh, yeah. I bet you it can fit on a note card. <laughs> you're probably right. Back in the olden days, like what did they didn't write a word document with maybe eventually double spacing and <laughs> yeah, numbered right. lines and each individual one being referenceable. No, but there is a fantastic podcast call from a uh, lawfare called Trump trial and tribulations, which comes out every Wednesday. And it is three constitutional scholars and lawyers that sit in every single one of his many cases and they go, what the is going on here? And then they try to understand it. It is fantastic. Mm -hmm. It is sad, but it is quite informative. What's the name of the podcast? Lawfare. And it's the Trump's trials and tribulations. It's the sub one. They also, I I just think, I just think the end result of this is going to be that they kick it on standing and say that Congress needs to. I don't know. I because, do not know. I, because I, I think it's going to Otherwise, you could just, that, it, it's a, they already did it. Yeah, like, they have right. to. But the point that I, I'm making is, like, how can you, then a state court can just go convict anyone they want of insurrection. Can Who I decides think- it? So, let's slow down. Sorry. You got to go back to the original case. And the government sued. He, he was, they sued to remove him from the ballot. Right. In other words, somebody made a case that they go, this is illegal because of the 14th Amendment. Hey, JD. The 14th Amendment that he's not allowed to be on the ballot. This is happening in four states. Colorado's the first one. It's also a big one going on in Wisconsin. But oh. they basically it was a political action group or pl- active group or some group brought a case and the case is going through this structure. So the decision on the case was to force every level to make this choice because it was nebulous and there's different interpretations. And how do you deal with different interpretations in the United States law? You sue people. And then when you win the case or lose the case, you now have the case precedent set. So that's literally what is being done right now. And this one, we knew it was going to hit the Supreme Court. Interesting. So, so after yeah, this, this isn't just a this isn't just a state deciding to. I'm going to say no. It's because somebody sued to remove him from the ballot, which is right. the American way. 
we can sue for anything all the time. And this is how you bring, this is how you question laws. So yeah, I think after I, this, whatever the Supreme Court rules, like that will then trickle down to the other states. So, right? okay. No. Well, like the, the worst thing for, no, wait, the other three states, not, well, hold not on. necessarily, state. they're different, no. they're different rules. They're different. So the, the the worst thing for Trump here would be if if the Supreme Court decided to let the state's decision stand. Yeah, that would yes. be the death. That, yes. that would be the death of his second term. Yeah. Yes. That would. So the thing of the matter is, then it would make every single person, well, not politically picked, anybody that doesn't want him on the ballot, would go race cases in every other state, and then you would have a lot of cases where he could get pulled from, and if you get four of them. Let's say you get two of the purple states or the pink, and then you're done. And so, and then he'd probably be abandoned before that because there's no. I just don't to know if they would let that happen. So, what do you mean by that? And I who's feel like the that. They? Well, because they being the Supreme Court, anyone that actually wants this experiment to continue. Because in that situation, aren't you then just paving the road for basically uh, someone with a lot of money to to stop people from ever running for president? It's not paving the road, so I disagree. It's not paving the road for anybody with lots of money to say no. It's saying this sets precedent and each state is allowed to make its own decision on what when insurrection is. They have now the ability to do it and they will go use their own Supreme Court model to do it. It's what the Supreme Court decided for Roe v. Wade. Why wouldn't it be right for this? It's not, so I'm not making parallels, but I'm just saying it uh, does it's, make it, sense. It's states uh, like a federalism, yes. like states rights issues. Yeah. So I'm not a big fan of that, but I, I think there needs to be, it's yeah. The worst, what, what's probably going to happen is, and this is my guess and I'm not a lawyer, blah, blah, blah. Is they're going to find a technicality on why to send it back down. Yeah. So let, let and me that way it won't be a set. Like when basically before, they didn't have standing or something. Sorry, go ahead, Ozzy. When I was going to say, when I said before that, uh, the, uh, you said there were four states in total, right? I think three or four. I don't remember three which or ones. four. They're, they're so independent why, cases. You said it would be different rules for each state. I'm so there's by three that. clauses. There's three or four clauses that are currently being adjudicated for different reasons in different states. Oh, okay. Some are following literally the letter of the law of the same case that Colorado did, but I think Wisconsin is for clause three versus clause four. I don't remember. Don't quote right. me on okay. that. But they are different s- sub clauses and they're try- going for different methods. Is by and large still coordination, but they're trying to use whatever they can. But if states were to, let's say the Supreme Court ruled that Colorado can decide not to have them on a ballot, right? They mm-hmm. ruled, they leave it up to the states. Then any other state that that's that would try to enact the same clause right then that game's over at that point right yep i, I think yeah, but go ahead. what i was going to say for me if what three key states are able or even any of the battleground states wisconsin's huge yeah, yeah. it's a battleground state ohio yep. Ohio's not really up for grabs, I don't think, right now. No, but... My, I don't know. No, I, it's I not up for that grabs, I, but if something crazy were to happen in Ohio, if somebody were to make a decision in Ohio, it's a red state. Decision, it's an extremely red legislator. Yeah, so that... And that would be it. It's, I think it's... I, I More don't than know a swing this. state, I think. I don't know this, but it's going to be states that have strong Supreme Courts are the ones that are going to have this go. And if I remember correctly, Ohio's is not. In fact, I think they had to do a referendum because they couldn't get the Supreme Court to deal with their legislator. <laughs> so, so, so like, wait, is it the state Supreme Court that's deciding this? Or yes. well, in Colorado, it already now it decided. Up. Now it's getting kicked up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Got it. It's a two-hour podcast that's every week to explain the cases that are going on against the former well, president. What's, well, what I find interesting is, think about it from this angle. The, if there's two key things that they need to decide on. The, the first thing we just talked about, but the other one is a pr- presidential immunity. So it, how can you decide 
just play it out that a president can can be immune from basically president so this is established law and it's just never been tested with the president so everything could get weird with that because there's different opinions on that is that you cannot commit you have immunity for doing your job not immunity when you can when you're doing something outside of your job and that's the the bifurcation now the I'm going to you talk about Mark Meadows because it's a more interesting case than it yeah, is Yeah Mark Meadows trend. is more interesting because he's he was on the well he's got the best case of all the people that work for Trump because he's like, my job was to be effectively Trump's bitch I was the uh, right. I was his chief of staff I was the man that would do if he said I needed a hamburger I could make sure that somebody got him a hamburger he was so what the role is is a very unique role in that he is intermingled with personal and pre, and presidential responsibilities he keeps his calendar for personal and pro, and executive functions and because of that he's making the case that like my job is always my job and it is always there is no line but here's the interesting part the part why i think this is doubtful and this is just a non-scholar is that you can't campaign and call that privilege as a part of your executive so if you're a senator and you go and you want to dial for numbers you have to leave for the congress building it's you a have hatch, to go to the violence. dnc yep same thing applies to the president same thing president mark meadows except for nuance and now we got to go figure out what that nuance means because it's not they don't do it in the same way they don't keep a strict rule so it's going to be interesting the hatch is different than the uh, because it's raising money, but yeah, it's the same idea. I spent too much time in legal podcasts. Yeah, I feel I feel like I need to go listen to some legal podcasts now. This sounds legal. Anything is fan- fascinating. If yeah. you want a f- more fun podcast that's less in the weeds, there's Con Law by Roman Mars, where he and a constitutional sp- scholar just talk about the history of constitutional law for the last 30 years and it takes left turn after like right turn and you're sitting here going like they did what oh my god so my, my do you want to know what my my like fear is that th- all of this could be great like it, ingrained in law but you know it could just be a twitter mob that decides oh. what's going to happen i feel like you know i'm talking I mean? over no, yeah, I know. There's a weird, there's a weird lag today, but my, my fear is that all this shit is a moot point next year. Me, and it's especially like for me, is especially worrisome because I'm in Washington D.C. Anyway, how would I put this? Here's my one sentence theory on everything: dealing with Trump is a political process. You can never do it through legal means. And anytime you are using legal means to impact political outcomes, it will be bad. Yeah. Because it's going to look like you're. It's a political process. Trump is a political problem. He needs to be dealt with politically, not legally, not through the courts, not through the blah. As much as I want, because I'm, I have Wait, no problem saying you need I'm to not expand, a you, you need to expand on that statement. You're saying what they're currently trying to do or just period. With the Georgia case, with the New York case. You, you have to do all the legal things. You have mm-hmm. to do all the law. You have to make sure nobody's above the law. Completely agree with that. But I'm solving the Trump problem is not about bringing a case. It's about the, what the case will mean for the politics. Will it turn people away? Will he stop getting votes? Will he still be able to be yeah. the nominee? It is not about those putting him to jail. It's not about trying to make him removing from the ballot. I actually don't agree with that. I think it's about making sure people have a communication process. That this man is, for lack of a term, a shady fuck. Whether you agree or not, I don't know. Now, do you still want to vote for him? Yeah. Right. Because, it, because all the other things, you have to do them, but ultimately, he... If people vote him in, you have to deal with it. You have to deal with it. As much as I don't want to, you have to. And that's what I mean by it's a political process. 
th- these things have to go forward to change people's minds. And there are certain people that will never change their mind, but nope. enough of that. that. Except and, and that's the world. I, I agree with you. I actually do agree with you. The exception to what you just said is if the 14th Amendment insurrection clause is held up. I don't think so. Even though it is the rule of law, I don't the think the only it will way matter. to the only way to override it is a three two thirds vote in both houses. I think is the only way to. And and legislator is always politics. I think that the mm-hmm. impeachments failed because yeah, and that is a political process. That is the definition of the process we have for dealing with it. There is a nuance that I'm unconvinced on on whether he can be on the ballot, and that's one. That I am, I, I would concede more on my idea about it being a political process that he might have invalidated himself in the process of the insurrection. That is a legal process, a constitutional process, just like you have to be 35 years old. But I, I, it's in, in order for the country to be strong and, and handle a transition well, I think it needs to be a political process that decides he's. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. It's in way. We are getting worse by the fucking day. Like it is since 2016 and it's been just sliding downhill, dude. It's very polarized. It's people are just every aspect of it seems to be getting worse and seems to be getting more divided. So I I think, and listen, that stuff might've been there before. It might've just never surfaced. I think you're, but I it think is you're seeing it's the result the, of sorry yeah but you know it's this the equivalent of hey there are probably tons of people that would commit a crime if we didn't have laws so there's a reason to have laws right so you can say that a lot of this stuff was unearthed be recently because of trump but and people probably felt that way before but i think these people are no longer in check yeah. i think we are just dividing further and further, and there's this huge gap in the middle now, which is only going to make things I worse. I think you can point to everything yes to what you stated. I also don't think it's a it's clear cut. Like It's on both sides, right? Like with freaking Menendez and the goddamn gold bars. <laughs> yeah. It like, is. That's what I mean. Yeah. By it's gotten very polarized. And if we go back to one of the podcasts we recorded a while ago, how my opinion on media is... It's just gotten very, you know, media has lost its way. It's, there is the left media that's gone extreme left. The right media has gone extreme right. There are very few media outlets that are in, that operate in the middle anymore. And are very, I can't, it's objective. very hard to find one. Yeah. Uh, Ozzy, I recommend the book, Why America's Polarized by Ezra Klein. It's a very good book and it will basically confirm everything you just basically yeah. said. I, I love his podcast. It's, I listen to his podcast all the time. The, I disagree with it, though. I actually think it's more fundamental. I think it is a function of number of people in communication path. I do not believe we can handle the speed and the size of communication right now. I just don't. And I don't think it's a function of media, social media, TV or any of that. I do not think the amount of change that has happened in 40 years to make the world smaller, to make your go, your geography going from the max number of people you can know is 10,000 to now you have to interact and deal with the opinions of 10 of 5 billion. And I do not think our society and structure has figured out how to deal with that. And I don't want to like media is a part. Social media is a different part. All of it. It's just, it breaks our brains. Do you think that's a cause or an accelerator? All of, I, I just don't think we are socially able to do it. I don't think the human brain is capable of dealing with this many opinions. I listen, I don't disagree, but that's, I think part of the problem. Oh, I I, I am. That's a, yeah. But But I, I I don't, I, I don't know if I agree that it's the, inability to be able to deal with this many people i think the problem is more that 
because of the, our our modes of communication now are very it's a slice of instagram it's a, enough for not everyone but many people a slice of facebook a slice of twitter a slice of these things and it's an echo chamber for most people so it's whatever they're interested in is now they're getting pumped full of whoever whatever political avenue that generally they grew up around most people are moderates that's the reason it's called moderate so so i wait i just want jeremy to clarify this thing because you said number of people i don't i didn't think jeremy was referring to number of people i oh you yeah, was. Okay. i was just talking yeah. the number of people you interact with the capability you know oh, and by the way 15 20 yeah. people to twenty thousand. yeah and, and, yeah, okay, and John, I, I think that your point is exactly in line with what I was saying is there was two crazy people in your pl- town of 800. Now you come in contact with every, cl- there's now 2 million crazy people and they can find each other. You, you just, well, you just don't know how to, you just don't know how to understand crazy now. Like, like before the way that we define crazy is that's one guy based on everyone that I interact with. Now yes. the, your definition of crazy is I interact with the fucking world and my sliver of the world is now being filtered yep. to be the, well, to crazy. Or I searched it out or I yeah. have the capabilities or I was, Hey, I liked looking at girls feet. So uh, now, and that was socially stop, but I found a group online that likes it too. Uh, and it's not just an echo chamber. It's just the availability. It's just numbers. It's just scale. And with instant communication and all the mechanisms to find them, scale of people turns into, I just don't know if we're ready to deal with it. Well, I think in addition to scale, it's in a way, especially for Trump, it's volume, right? Because one of the things he was really good at when he was president was the cycle was very quick, right? It would be one thing after another, nothing. The media did not have time to sit down and dig their claws into anything because then the That's next true. thing would spin up and then the next so thing would spin bullshit. up. So much bullshit. The churn. Yeah. But we, you see that with other people now too. They can do that. He was a master of it. Maybe he was an e- epoch in time of being able to do that. But I don't think that's a fundamental aspect. I think it's just a fundamental aspect of speed now and scale. And I think what you're saying is something I, I didn't mention, which is the short attention span or the now factor in the fact that everything has to be now and anything that's two days later is forgotten and people don't think over time. And hence why one of our most recent guests is literally we like, he's one of the smartest people because he thinks about things that are goes back three years or longer. It's in There's other universes. Well, Dr. Mike's fun. Yeah. But I think there's two different things there, though. There's what you just said, Jeremy. There's the sort of short attention span by people. And I think that's directly correlated to all the social media, all the the different media outlets, just the world we live in. That's one aspect. The other aspect, I think, is from the media industry. They The reason why Trump was able to flip story after story and craziness after craziness the media i think is starved to pull in consumers and i think that, one of the reasons that's, why that's they're, they're literally capitalism though for that but they need one to of the reasons yeah but one of the reasons they're having a hard time pulling consumers i think is because the amount of media outlets especially by just non-professionals right twitter instagram mm-hmm. so what we were talking about before has exploded, right? And also print media is died away and they're looking for ways to generate funds off of, you can't really generate so that I, much I funds off of, off of Twitter, right? Versus having, there, there needs to be a magazine. brand. Yeah. There's gotta be something like you're not just going to be like a, so I, I see this as a journalism versus media what i mean by that is the social media influencers and and real housewives and all those are personalities that right. people follow and whatnot and they'll break news tmz things like this like it's not 
that isn't the CBS. It's not the the Washington Post. It's not what is it? The journalistic. I, yeah, I'll go with that. It's like a it's a, a split, right? Media versus journalism. But yeah, the I, problem. But so problem I am with print media dying is that those journalistic institutions haven't made a like a level up to digital right they are I'm now gonna, but yeah no they're not so uh, the they're profit starting margins to. no well the profit they, margins they used to be able to sit there and go so he, the capitalism reigns in again is just like you said they're going to employ two investigative journalists and they're going to employ four people to write articles that feed them into an AI and they're going to pump out enough headlines to get enough clicks to just put enough advertising up. And then they're going to get one Pulitzer from one investigative art, uh, journalist because it's a speed game. Because in, in the game that they're playing, it's about fast. And, but don't get me wrong. I'm going to point out because the, there's going to be an enti- a bifurcation between the people that pay for news and pay for intelligent, well-written, well-researched da- data sets and often news-like stories, they're going to have a distinct advantage over time. I'm, I'm advantage how? Those who read and consume and pay for quality material will have an advantage going forward. How? By definition. Information has always been power yeah. forever and Rude ever. Okay, and no, so yeah, no. I mean, that's all I'm saying. E- I don't disagree with that, right? Except the reason why I kept asking uh, advantage how is because how do you explain that advantage? Like they're going to have an advantage over what? It's very simple. Someone that pays for, let's just say, financial and news in order to make money, they pay for a subscription to real information. They're oh, yeah. a lot more advantageous than someone who is reading Instagram. Yes. And playing on Robin Hood. And if they can't no, afford absolutely. the other thing, Agreed. never Agreed. gonna. I'm talking about the, I'm asking the question with the, through the lens of the common person that's not in any industry where they have to get news to make money, right? Just consumers. Do you pay for a Washington Post subscription? No. Do you pay we, for we any talked subscriptions? Ab- we talked about that <laughs> a few episodes ago. So how do you no, find out I, what the Washington Post is doing if they're the only investigative journalists? Through you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good question. And I'm not, I listen, I'm not against, like I said a couple of episodes ago, I'm just getting back into sort of jumping into reading and consuming, consuming news. I'm now at the, at that decision point where I have to decide, okay, what's, what am I going to subscribe to? Maybe it's WAPO. Maybe it's something else. Rather than going down the, that path of the, I think the the thing to highlight here though, is not everyone is going to make that conscious decision before when people watch the evening news because that was the only thing on television they were becoming informed simply by watching the evening news and it it wasn't propaganda <laughs> as much as it yeah, is now it was depending everything is. it was but it's not like depends on the channel you watch the propaganda <laughs> um but there's a reason why i'm asking this question right because okay so the people that are well informed right Besides making any sort of any career or monetary decisions based off the information they get, if you're in in an industry where you're reading information, you're getting news to make money. Let's put that aside. How does and I don't disagree with you guys, but I just want to tease this out. How does the well-informed person have an advantage over the other person? Besides the fact that. The well-informed, listen, the ob- there's the obvious. The well-informed person is more well-informed and more educated and smarter. Let's put that to the side as well. No. What, are the, other tangible, tangible, need to be what are the other tangible advantages? They no, pass it I'm on gonna to their kids. Clarify. Go ahead, they, sorry. They tap, pass on the habit and they make it a part of their daily life to their kids. 
their kids will be better off than kids that don't have that habit. Okay, fair. And they will yeah. have a gen, and that is the definition of generational, the beginning of generational wealth, is you're passing on habits and attributes that will put you in an advantage position. Yeah. I live in a town where I literally am surrounded by that in the whole, uh, and I take advantage of it. But I also understand it's not very moral. It's not a and, perfect well, system. Let me before, John. Before you go, let me just go. Let me just explain why I was pulling on that thread a little bit. Because we're getting to a point, and if things keep going, keep trending the way they're going, we're getting to the point where the folks that are well informed are going to be in the minority, and the advantage might not be as big as you think it may be, because the majority of people are consuming trash journalism, trash news, getting bad information. So the advantage might not be as big as we think it would be. And I, do, I agree with everything you just said, Jeremy, and everything that, that John was saying. I was just teasing it out to get to that point, right? Yeah. It, it's interesting. Yeah. Big part of me to answer this, a big part of me is like, how much do you go down the road of like hyperbole? But the reason I say that is you have the, the movie from the nineties idiocracy, right? <laughs> I still Where, haven't seen it. <laughs> what? Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, that's not going on this road. There's so many. No, might have to I'm do an idiocracy no, with life watch. Cause I, I when it yeah, comes to I, I movies, like, I'm always the victim yeah, listen, when it comes to movies. So this is not a victim put. This is a mystery science theater 3000 with a surprise. I am willing to dedicate one episode to watching that movie with you. <laughs> oh, yes. 100%. <laughs> and then I we'll feel get like we're saying it on. on well, no, podcast. we just. We won't <laughs> show the episode. We'll just do the I time. I feel codes. like I've I feel like I've already watched the whole movie because I've heard so much about it back to what it was 2014 2015 oh was that the movie list time yeah no. around that time it, it was oh, as things this is a, as we were ramping up to the election 2016 election there was a lot of talk about that and so i feel like i've heard enough of the snippets and the bits of the movie where i know the whole thing by now but i will watch it my point not going down that road, but, <laughs> but realistically, if, if the individuals you're talking about are in the minority, then, then we're, we could potentially be going towards a, a problem because they're also generally the ones that are paying the taxes. We're, I think we're already, listen, I, listen, my, my statement may have been a little bit too harsh when I said, this country's going to shit, but we are slipping down a, a very slippery slope I, right now. I, I can see a world where we're in that sort of, that's our reality. We're living in that world. It's much clearer to see that now. And it's potentially not that far away. I'm going to challenge you. I want you to pause for a second and I want you, I'm going to give you another challenge. I would like you to go look at how many bombings there was in the United States in the 1970s. On average, there was close to 40,000. It was re people like the hit with, we forget history. America is a very strange country. It has a very long, weird history. Mm -hmm. with a very violent history. It is not, the more I learn about the history of America, the more I don't feel like we're at a precipice. I feel like we're at another precipice. And that and I know that sounds weird. Feels no, like it's, it's a weird. constant thing with this particular experiment. It, it's not weird. The only thing I would counter that with is the statement we were just making before about the difference now is that the crazies speak to the other crazies. Before you were speaking to one other crazy in your town, and now you have the reach to be able it's, to reach a it's million. It's easier crazies. to organize. Exactly. 
I mean, hell, not disagree. We all use tools now in our, in our daily work to organize. But I'll also make the same. Look thing at what is, we're doing right now. But at the same time, the people that made everything better through from World War II on, there's been lots of improvement at the same time, and they did it without the same communication either. So there is ways to fix this. There's ways to improve things that everybody it is truly Absolutely. democratized. I'm not t- t- the oh no, neither am I. I'm not but the part the I'm actually worried done. about. We're effed, right? But it's just my, I'm actually not worried about the crazy people. I'm worried about people not doing something because they're too fucking busy. That is always that is my biggest worry now is not that the, the crazies are going to win. It's that every that just enough people are too busy that they can't show up. Too to busy and too thing. numb and too tired. I'm, I don't even know if numb is the right word. Yeah. But maybe. You I think as a society, but- we're getting really numb to a lot of things. Like you see things now and you're like, oh, there's another hate crime, another... It, whatever pops up in the news, it seems like we're getting really numb to a lot of the things. Well, that are we're getting numb society. to it because we're seeing it. But everything that was happening that no that you never knew about because it wasn't in front of you, you're seeing it now. Oh, but it's yeah. also st- <laughs> that's it's what we're also talking about, right? Yeah, but it's drastically less. So the part what? we got to come to. Oh, what's less? Is- crime and horribleness oh, in the United oh, States. Oh, yeah. yeah. But the different, but sure, yes, it, it's going down since the 60s and 70s. Continue. There was a spike. But, he got weird for a little bit, but it usually does. But the problem is, again, back to the original thing, is that now you, your community is a lot larger now. <laughs> so you're seeing yes. a lot more problems. Did also, I just say violently agree with? Also, I would say this. Crime may be down, but I think targeted crime towards specific communities are probably up. Oh, yeah. I agree with that. I'm, I don't know. I don't want to argue. I'm going to guess. I'm going to say something probably heretical. I probably would say, no, it's not true. I'm going to say, oh, my God, how much it was in the past. You can that, go. I'm just going to, just a function. You're saying compared to a specific oh. Or no. compared to two years ago. I'm talking about, well, how far back? If we go back to the 80s, it was awful. Awful how bad oh. everybody that wasn't, they were, come on, it was bad. Wait, Part- so hold on. Let's, yeah, let's clarify a couple of things. Sure. For the black community, it's always been bad. So let's just yes. put them to the side. Right? I, I feel uh, as a non-member, I can't say anything. Yes, always been bad. Community has not always. It's been yeah, man. It's not. It's not been as bad as it's been recently. What? Like during in the during last two World years? War II? No, like, they literally put them in the... concentration camps. Okay, listen. I'm talking about. I'm. We're not talking about that. We're talking about targeted crimes, not what. So governments so, so and I, states are so doing. We're talking of not governments. We're talking about individual crimes. So, so you're talking about like not after 9-11 where anyone brown was targeted. Yeah. That, yeah, that like happens. That stuff. Yeah. That, targeted crimes. Asian community. Right now, it's either the Jewish community or Palestinians, <laughs> depending on which side is attacking so, the other side. But, and that's for a different reason. I, I, didn't wanna, I don't want to bring that into because that's different. But I think just to just clarify the point, if we just take the Asian community as an example, after COVID, the yeah, I would agree crime rate for the Asian community spiked up. And that, uh, I, I, I think it's a lot more targeted crime now compared to downloading the FBI based on ethnicity for the, since from 2007, 17. Yeah in the rates i'm not going to be able to do this analysis in real time <laughs> but, but my, SQL my database my Give guess time, dude my gu- but my guess is what it's going to show is that based on the society or whatever was happening at that time 
a particular group was is going to be hired. Now, is it worse from one time to another? So, so for what I mean by that, for example, is Asians right after COVID, and I'm sure during the SARS like scares of or, or was it the early 2000s when the first SARS? I'm sure there were things around that time too. I think they dropped and then like, I don't think they're sustained is what I'm saying. Right. No, I would would probably agree with that. But I agree agree with the Israeli and Palestinians. Absolutely. But that's, I I wanted to put that to the side because that's for a different reason, right? That's two sides. It's happening. But yeah, but it's for a different reason, but I'm counter arguing myself now. (laughs) I said, put it to the side, but. It's a different reason, but it still goes back to the crux of the problem is I think because of the information and because of the avenues to be able to share information and the bad information that gets shared really quickly, back to our example of two crazy people in a town versus having access to two million crazy people. I think that is what you're seeing with the Palestinians and the Israelis is a result of that, like misinformation being spread quickly, yeah. hate being spread a lot quicker. So I have a good numbers. FBI hate crimes. Now I'm not breaking it down by groups, but it's going to be basically ethnicities and whatnot, hate crimes. In 2007, it was around 8,000 recorded hate crime incidents, 8,000 of them. It dro- the lowest year recorded was 2014 with 6,000. And it's back up to 2020 at 7,700. So we're back at the 2027, 2007 time period. But if you look at those numbers, that's a 20% change, plus and negative over time, over basically 13 years. Goes down and back up. Where did they get get their stats from? FBI. I know, where does the FBI get their stats from? I I just looked this up and I went and found the days that real quick. I don't know how to go, can't give you a good answer without doing real research. And I don't want to say something that, but that, that is just a culmination of the data. I did make sure that it was from the FBI. So they do a reasonable good job in historically of yeah. keeping things consistently over time. I just, when I think about sexual assaults, like a lot of them are not reported, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So a lot of the hate crimes are either not reported or, or classified as something else. Exactly. Well, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying, right. as long as it's consistent in their same percentages at these kind of numbers, you should be consistent over time. Yeah. The question is, is did the mood change at the a broad enough population so they be people behave differently? At 13 years, I bet they did, particularly with I don't know COVID, pandemic, Trump as a president. These kind of things would shift those numbers, so you have to correct for them. But I'm not the stati- stati- statistician that did this. It's also right. not. But, it's only ten year or yeah. And I'm years. also i I want to argue against you, Ozzy, but I can't because there's. Why do you, they, you always say that. You say that a lot. I want to against you, but I can't because I do. I love arguing. You know that. <laughs> I know, but I'm not saying. I would like to know the details about it and i will go yeah. look up the stuff and, and research because i find it interesting because yeah. if i'm wrong my intuition is wrong even better i don't think i don't think we're going to get any smoking guns here that's going to prove it wrong one way or the other it's just or you'd have to collect a lot of data in order to no make i that sorry, not wrong that my intuition was badly focused and had the wrong calibration okay so I make a lot of decisions with that mental model I have. The gut check? The it's not necessarily the gut check. I'm like, things don't change that fast. People really, as much as it feels worse, it takes time for things with You're 300 frog, million people. Dude. Maybe. Yeah. Fun, fun stuff. Since this has been our most political context in a while.
That wraps it up for this episode of the Surprise Multiplayer Podcast. As always, we thank you for listening and hope that you'll join us again soon. As a reminder, any feedback, suggestions, or questions can be sent to banterreviewcrew at surprisemultiplayer.com. Until next time, keep exploring and stay curious.